morning and a warm welcome to Crescent Church Online. We hope that you'll be enriched through the fellowship that we share together this morning and from the ministry of God's Word. Let's open our service with the hymn, Great is the Lord and Most Worthy of Praise. The chorus goes, And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal, throughout earth and heaven proclaim. pray to our eternal Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to come into your presence in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been reflecting in our opening hymn on your greatness and your glory and our desire to lift your name on high. For you alone are God eternal throughout earth and heaven above. We acknowledge that we were sinners who deserved your punishment for our sins. We were alienated from you without hope, but we give thanks that we've been brought near to you through the blood of Christ. We ask for your blessing on our service today. We thank you that technology allows us to have this fellowship with each other in these testing times. And as as we join this service, we acknowledge that some of us may feel lonely or worried or frightened. We pray that there will be an end in sight for this awful virus that has caused devastation across the world. We pray for our leaders who have to take decisions that will impact on us all, and for the scientists who seek a vaccine, and for our health and care workers who put themselves at risk on a daily basis as they provide care and compassion to the sick. In all of this, we ask that you will give us your peace. Bless Ollie as he brings your word to us. Let it stay in our hearts and refresh and encourage us for the week that lies ahead. Amen. Let us sing, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart.
Ivara Lo is going to bring the reading to us from 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. And after that, Ollie Neal will bring the message to us. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Samuel anoints David. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went on to Ramah. A very good morning, everyone. The coronavirus pandemic has put world leaders to the test, hasn't it? Some seem to have come out of this crisis looking pretty good, so far at least. South Korean leader President Moon is a case in point. He went from facing calls to resign because of slow economic growth and political scandal, to winning a landslide victory back in April after a campaign which emphasised his positive response to COVID-19. In stark contrast, though, is Boris Johnson and his government. Three in four Britons apparently approved of the way Boris was handling this crisis back at the beginning. By June, the British government had the lowest domestic approval rating in the world. Interestingly, the high point for Boris was when he himself got coronavirus. His approval ratings at that point peaked at 56%. I think that shows that we love a leader who we can relate to and who we feel can relate to us. A leader who understands the pain that we're going through. During a time of crisis uh, in particular, we crave effective leadership, don't we? we? We place our trust in those in authority and we look to them for hope for stability, and also for reassurance. I'm sure you, like me, watch those daily government briefings 
Um, and we saw the prime minister or some senior member of government flanked by some of the country's top scientists. And I think for many of us, that brought a sense of calm, a sense that things were under control. Napoleon Bonaparte put it like this. He said, a leader is a dealer in hope. And when we turn to the scriptures, we see that God loves good leadership. Those that lead well, whether it be in their home life, their church life, or their work life. In fact, what they do when they lead well in those environments is they live in accordance with their design plan. They reflect the image of God. And craving effective leadership in a time of of instability is nothing new. The Israelites were longing for, for that same kind of thing after a really rough and tumultuous period in their history. During the the period of the judges, the Israelites had repeatedly undermined God's kingship. Time and time again, they'd grievously sinned against the Lord. They'd rejected his rule and his authority. Yet time and time again, the Lord in his goodness had been gracious to them. He'd rescued them from the hands of their enemies. Yet the people of Israel were intent on being their own kings. The phrase that we hear repeated over and over again in the book of Judges is this, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Self-rule reigned. The God of autonomy existed then, just as it does so overtly today in Belfast. We love to rule our own little kingdoms. We love to wear our own little crowns. Relativism, this idea that that anything goes, that's the governing principle. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And in a bid to, to correct the turmoil and corruption and insecurity, Israel asks for a king. And they specify that they want a king like the nations around them. And you see, the issue isn't that they want a king. In fact, that was God's plan all along. If you look back at Genesis, if you, if you look at the, the stories of Abraham and of Jacob, we see that God's plan is that a king would come from their line. But the issue is they want a king like the nations around them. They want a king who, who's going to protect them militarily, who's going to be a warlord and lead them into battle. Someone strong and courageous, a man they can trust. And in desiring that kind of king, what they were actually doing was rejecting God as king. The Lord says that explicitly uh, to to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7. He says, Samuel, it's, it's not you they've rejected, but they've rejected me as king. And I think those words are completely and utterly tragic. After years of experiencing the Lord's goodness and grace, time and time again, he'd rescued them when they did not deserve it. Once again, they rebel against him and they say, in effect, we want to put our confidence in a man. What they're doing is they're rejecting the the role that God has given them as a nation. They're meant to be our holy people set apart for, for, for God. And as Tim Chester puts it, they were supposed to be a light to the nations around them. They were supposed to reveal the rightness of God's rule. But instead of the nations learning from Israel, Israel learns from the nations. In effect, they're saying, look, Lord, to be honest, to be honest with you, we just want to be like the nations around us. We just want to have a king like they have. You know, Lord, actually, that would give us confidence. We really want confidence and reassurance right now. And we need a strong man. We need a man we can trust. And to be honest, Lord, that's where we're going to put our hope from now on. Thank you very much. They want to live by sight and not by faith. And the Lord, and the Lord warns them there's going to be a cost to that. He tells them that, that to desire a king like the nations is to desire someone who's going to be a taker rather than a giver. He's going to be a warlord who conscripts their sons into the army, who makes them endure hard labor for his own ends who taxes them heavily to the rich and powerful grow more rich and more powerful. He's going to use them to further his own ends. He's not going to be a king who really cares for them. And what do the people do? In classic human fashion, they refuse to listen. They reject God's king, even though he says it's going to mean effectively enslavement for you. It's going to mean you face tyranny. 
Man, that is so like us. We think we're more free without God. But it's a lie from the devil himself. Yet God grants them their request. And sometimes God gives us exactly what we ask for, just so we can see how foolish and stupid we are. Just so we can see how badly things go once we cut him out of the picture. And so Saul, the people's choice is anointed king. Now, at this point, I imagine some of you are probably thinking, I I thought this was meant to be a character study on David, and I hear you, and I promise you we will come to David. But, But I think to understand the significance of David, why David was God's choice as king, it's absolutely vital that we have, that we understand why Saul was not. To understand why David was a man after God's own heart, we need to understand why Saul wasn't. What made these two men so different? If you look down with me uh, at 1 Samuel chapter 16, look at verse 1. Let's read it together. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So right at the start of our passage, we learn that, that Saul has been rejected by God. The people's choice, now rejected by God. He wasn't God's king. Instead, uh, as the Lord says to Samuel here, God's king is to be found in a little insignificant town called Bethlehem. You see, Saul represents a worldly view of leadership. His physical appearance was striking. We're told that he was a head taller than all the people around him. He looks like a king. He looks like a military leader. And to be honest, his story seems to start pretty well. There's a, there's a kind of a humility about him. There's a diffidence about him. We read that he hides among, among the luggage, among the bags, instead of thrusting himself into the limelight. There seems to be something, something positive in his character. And initially, he even attributes his military success to the Lord. Yet very quickly after he's confirmed as king, Saul's personality seems to, to change. He moves from this man who mediates the rule of God to a man who seeks to usurp or replace the rule of God. And just as the Lord warned, rather than bringing liberation and unity and the security that the people of Israel absolutely craved, rather than doing that, what happens is slowly but surely he brings division to the nation and oppression. Rather than exalting the lowly, Saul exalts himself. I read this quote from Abraham Lincoln and I thought it was uh, incredibly relevant to Saul. Abraham Lincoln said, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Power revealed Saul's character. Power revealed Saul was not a man after God's own heart. Saul's faith was revealed to be rooted in superstition. In chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, he offers a sacrifice that that only Samuel should have offered. And because of of Saul's fear that the Lord wouldn't intervene to grant him victory in this battle, uh, he he decided, I'm going to make that sacrifice myself. And he didn't trust the Lord. He didn't trust the Lord and wait for the Lord's deliverance. Then at the dark climax of Saul's life, when once again he's in fear of his enemies, the Lord doesn't respond. And as a result, Saul seeks out this medium or this witch to try and contact the now deceased Samuel. And in doing so, he proves right up to the end of his life that this whole religion thing, this whole God thing, all it was for Saul was a tool to get what he wanted. His mind was corrupted by power. His mind became dark and twisted because he failed to trust God and he was so obsessed with himself and his own power and his own control. You know, that hateful jealousy he had of David. He was so obsessed with himself. And he had power, plenty of power. But his heart was so, so far from God. Another symptom of a heart without faith was Saul's failure to bring unity through his leadership. Right at the beginning of Saul's story, we read that he's out searching for his lost donkeys. 
And this is almost like a picture of a failed shepherd. He'd lost, he'd lost those he was meant to be looking after. And that inability to care for the people of God revealed itself throughout his leadership. Saul became fixated on killing David, obsessively almost. And that was to the detriment of his people. David was one of his best warriors. But yet Saul was driven by jealousy and pride. And the culmination of Saul's reign was a divided kingdom. The house of Saul and the house of David stood opposed to one another. So as we look at the life of Saul, we see someone who is the very opposite of a man after God's own heart. And as you hear Saul's story or or little aspects of it, I wonder if you feel any sense of conviction. Why not ask yourself, is my faith more than just a superstition? Do I actually even have a genuine faith? Do I ever step out into the unknown and and really trust and rest in God? Or or am I always self-dependent? Is my faith more of a backup for when things go wrong? That's what it was for Saul. But you know, in some parts of the world, Christians literally have to trust God for every meal on the table. They live each and every day by faith that God will provide the very bread for them to eat. We're so sheltered in our own little bubbles here in Northern Ireland. How often do we live by faith? And what about caring for the people of God as Saul failed to do? He was so self-absorbed, so caught up in chasing David around. The question to ask ourselves is what are we chasing at the expense of caring for our brothers and sisters? What petty disagreements are getting in the way of that? And now we get to David and you're thinking, finally, we've seen all that it's not to be a man after God's own heart. And now we'll see what it is. David represents God's choice as king. Unlike Saul, David wasn't the obvious choice. Look down at verse 7 of 1 Samuel 16. The prophet Samuel, he sees this parade of brothers pass before him and, and Eliab looks particularly impressive. But in verse 7, we read this. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this verse is absolutely crucial. It's almost the climax of what I want to try and communicate this morning. One reason I'm thankful for this verse is, is uh, although I'm the oldest of, of my three brothers, uh, I'm now unfortunately the shortest, uh, which was a fairly heartbreaking realization. So, so on that level, this verse really appeals to me. But on a much more serious note, we're a society that's obsessed with appearance, aren't we? Obsessed with the way people look, with people's academic achievements or job titles or salary or biceps. How others perceive us is such a massive deal to 21st century humans. But the Lord sees the heart. He knows the authentic you like no one else does. And I wonder, what did the Lord see when he looked at David's heart? Well, I believe that unlike Saul, David was a man of faith. And God saw that when he looked at him. David was a man who had a God-centric view of reality. The story of Goliath, I think, illustrates that brilliantly. David was incensed that this Philistine was defying the armies of the living God. And Saul and his army, they were terrified and they cowered in fear. And David puts himself forward to meet the challenge of Goliath. You see, the difference between Saul and David's outlook here quickly becomes apparent. Saul thinks so humanly about the situation. Look what he says. He says, you're not going to be able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man and he's been a warrior from his youth. What are you thinking, David? Look at the facts. It's so obvious you won't be able to cope with this situation. David, by contrast, is God-centric. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saying, Saul, It doesn't matter what it it looks like on a human level. I trust in the living God. Unlike Saul, David has learned to live by faith. As he sat out at night 
with his flock, protecting them from the wild animals. He learned to trust God that they might make it safely through the night. In Psalm 4, he writes something similar. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Those times when you lie on your bed, maybe your teeth chattering, your mind churning, your your heart pounding. Where do you turn in those moments for comfort and peace? Maybe you get your phone out to try and distract you or, or a book. Maybe you think of all the practical ways that you can resolve this situation in the morning. Well, learn from David to be God-centric. Talk to the Lord. Hand your anxieties over to him. Leave them there. I know it's hard. It is hard. But God promises there's a peace that will follow. And the more we do this, as David did in the fields at night, the more we do that, the more prepared we'll be to trust God when the big things do come along, inevitably. We'll develop faith, character. We'll grow more and more God-centric. And as you all know, the Lord enables David to kill this giant with just a single stone from his sling. After this, time and time again, we see David demonstrate his faith in God. In 1 Samuel 25, he he gives thanks that the Lord sent Abigail to him so that he wouldn't take vengeance himself. He's so grateful for that. He's grateful that someone prevented him sinning against the Lord. Again, he's seeing the world through a God-shaped lens. Even when Saul dies, this bit blew my mind. Even when Saul dies, a man who's repeatedly tried to kill him, David laments. He mourns and weeps for the death of the Lord's anointed. Listen to these words. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. What a way to talk about your enemy, one who hated you. When Osama bin Laden was killed by U.S. Navy SEALs, There were celebrations in Times Square, celebrations in front of the White House. This great enemy, the great foe of the West was dead. Celebration seemed like the obvious thing to do. Why would you lament at the death of your enemy? Here's why. Because David acknowledged that Saul was the Lord's anointed. And the death of one appointed by God was something to be mourned. There was nothing to celebrate about that. And again, we see David's God-centric view of reality. Even when he failed badly, and and fail badly, he most certainly did. Look at how he repents in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. This is a God-centric prayer. This is a prayer of genuine remorse and repentance. A prayer which recognizes although his sin is so heinous and has hurt others, fundamentally at its deepest level, his sin is an offense against a holy God. And it's such a contrast to to Saul's excuse-laden response to his sin. In 1 Samuel 15, the prophet Samuel says to him, Why didn't you obey the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, came Saul's reply. He also then tries to, he he tries to blame others previous to that. He says, "Uh, the soldiers did it. He also blames fear. I was afraid of men. He tries to claim, actually, it was a sensible thing to do, Samuel. He even tries to claim he did it for God. All these excuses, all these reasons and justifications for his sin. And here we see so clearly the difference between a man who is God-centered and a man who is self-centered. It's so apparent, isn't it? So we've seen David's faith. We've seen his God-centeredness. Now we'll see that unlike Saul, David cared for the people of God. When we first encounter Saul in 1 Samuel, as I mentioned, he was chasing these lost donkeys. 
Look down with me at verse 11 of 1 Samuel 16. Where is David when we first encounter him? He's tending the sheep. He is a good shepherd who risks his life to protect his flock from wild animals. And that shepherd nature flows through into his kingship. And this is what God sees when he looks at David's heart. One of David's first acts as king was to help unify the country by making the neutral territory of Jerusalem into the nation's capital. Rather than stoke division throughout the country like Saul did, David actually had compassion on those who who would naturally have been his enemies. He specifically sought out members of Saul's house to show kindness to. That wasn't a normal thing for a king to do in those days. And we read the Lord gave uh, rest to David from his enemies. His early reign was defined by great victory and success and expansion. He was a king who, who had great faith in God, who genuinely cared for the people of God. That was so different to Saul. But great though David was, he too, like Saul, was corrupted by power. And ultimately, as as you know, he sinned grievously against the Lord, committing adultery with Bathsheba. And that sin led him on a downward path. His family become highly dysfunctional. It's, It's shocking to read some of the accounts. And in the end, David seemed a far cry from the glorious vision of God's future king we read of in Genesis, where it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. That looks so optimistic, so hopeful. And at first we think, could that be David? But then we see it's not. David doesn't look like the king whose house and kingdom are going to endure forever. And we're almost left wanting something more, aren't we? We think, yeah, it's better than Saul, but it's just not quite good enough. We want someone better, a better king. The Gospel of Matthew starts with the following words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we think, could this be him? Then if we flick to Luke's gospel, an angel announces that this Jesus will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. This, this is him. This is the true king of Israel, great David's greater son. Just like David, Jesus wasn't the obvious king. He was from a poor family, born in a little backwater called Bethlehem. Like David, Jesus had faith in God, his father, and cared deeply for the people of God. There's so many examples of of both those things. Yet unlike David, Jesus never failed. He lived a perfect life, and he gave his sinless life for a sinful people so that our hearts can be made right, so that we truly can be men and women after God's own heart, so that we can be made inwardly beautiful, so that we can live God-centric lives, faithful lives, and so that we can genuinely care for the people of God. So, So we can develop the character and capacities to be leaders in our homes, in our churches, in our workplace, or wherever else God calls us to, and ultimately so that we, we can lead with Christ and reign with him through all eternity. That is the end goal. That's why God is developing these characteristics within us. That's what your future looks like, reigning with Christ through all eternity. So as we close, ask yourself, what does God see when he looks at my heart? Do I show Christ-like leadership in my home life, in my church life, in the office? Is my faith more than superstition? Is it more than a tool that, that I use to get what I want, like Saul did? And do I have genuine care for the people of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we desperately don't want to be like Saul. 
a man who used religion to further his own ends, a man who was filled with pride and had no care for the people of God. Father, we see in David aspects of godly character. We love his faith. We love his longing to unite your people. Lord, we ask that you develop these good characteristics in our lives. But Lord, more than anything, we love that David points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the one who alone is worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise, the king who gave his life for us. Such love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. O Lord, by your spirit, make us more and more like Christ. Let us lead well in our homes, in our workplace, and in our churches. And in doing so, let us represent you faithfully to a watching world. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship his